uh, it's my pleasure. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Jing Zhao as this week's seminar speaker. Um, you know, her her career is one that you know we all hope to. Uh, uh, I don't know. Maybe we shouldn't aspire because we all have our own career directions, but certainly hers is one that is a great example. Uh, she does rigorous basic research in robotics. She's also served our country as an NSF program manager, and now she's starting a robotics engineering department uh, at WPI. Uh, so I will be quiet so Jing can tell us all sorts of good things. Thank you, Jing. Oh, thank you, Howie. Uh, thank you for inviting me here. Um, I'm very pleased to use this opportunity to share a little bit of uh, what we did with ro robot perception action synergy in uncertain environments. So we know when a no robot operating in an unknown, uncertain world, it requires sensing and perception to guide its motion. But often, um, the action is also needed to further enable perception in order to accomplish a task. So we're interested in combining perception and action as a whole to uh, accomplish complex tasks. I'd like to talk some uh, four sub areas of our research regarding perception and action synergy. Robotic assembly in the presence of uncertainty is the first area and autonomous object modeling and recognition, then real time adaptive motion planning in uncertain environments and semantic slam in unknown environments. Robotic assembly is very challenging and because of the type tolerance versus large motion sensing, various kinds of uncertainties, relatively speaking, which leads to varied contact space between the, the parts to be assembled. But research has dated back to 1970s for packing hole operations. Classical approaches include using passive compliant device or an active compliance via uh, contact state detections and transitions uh, with compliant control, uh, force or impedance control are the two types. More recently, there are learning-based approaches, learning by demonstration, uh, reinforcement learning, and other kinds of uh, um, variety of learning-based approaches. But still, um, only task-dependent or specific cases of assembly can be accomplished, or simple-shaped single pack and call cases. So multi-packing whole assembly of complex shapes remains an open problem. We are interested in autonomous complex assembly with a general task independent approach. I show here some two pack in whole assembly cases. Because of the uncertainty of the pack structure relative to the whole structure, um, several different kinds of multi-region complex complex can result. So our approach considered this general problem of having two parts, P and H, represented in a um, general hierarchical sphere tree structure. We use this kind of representation to enable uh, fast, complex uh, contact state analysis and constraint calculation. And also this representation is relatively independent of different shapes and geometry of the objects. So we also assume a nominal motion without considering uncertainty for just this insertion, some straight line motion to move the um, pack structure into the whole structure. And we assume six degrees of freedom, six dimensional position orientation uncertainty of the pack structure relative to the whole structure and using force torque sensing for perception. So once we have the robot um, we, we command the pack structure to move along a nominal motion into the whole structure, because of uncertainty, a contact situation happens. Now our approach just predict the possible contact configuration and then convert that con contact. Uh, it, first, the po possible consider, uh, configuration may not be a contact configuration. Um, as shown here, because we just add some uncertainty. So we convert this uncertain configuration to a contact configuration that's most likely 
to be the real case, assume the parts are, are rigid, right? And next, we compute the contact force based on contact configuration and further calibrate the computed contact force to a sensed force. This calibration step is important because all the computation is based on models and models are inaccurate with simplifications. So we want to try to bridge the gap between the model and the real sensory data by this calibration step. Next, we try to match the sensed uh, force cal calculated in this way and actual measured force by force drop sensor of the current situation. If the two forces match, we consider the estimated contact configuration to be accurate and we update the goal configuration based on uncertainty estimated and command the robot to move the pack structure into the updated goal uh, configuration. Uh, so if uh, the, the calibrated force and the measured force do not match, we uh, go about this process again to estimate another uncertain pose of the pack structure relative to the whole structure and so on. So now this shows how, just uh, briefly how we compute the contact configuration based on some uncertain configuration, which may result in uh, penetration of the parts. We consider this part in this pose and the parts in the contact pose to be um, virtually connected by a spring and try to find the contact configurations through constraint optimization to avoid penetration and minimize the potential energy. As uh, I said, we use sphere tree models to represent the parts. So it's easier to form the contact constraints just in terms of two spheres. It's very simple. And that's a uniform way of representing contact constraints regardless what um, arbitrary shapes the pack and hole assume. And then we use uh, just Hooke's law to do a simple contact force computation. So here's an, an example. Uh, we have this uh, two-pack assembly case with this uh, H-shaped curved hole. So it's not some regular circular hole. Um, and the nominal motion will lead this uh, a failure and resulted in a contact. Then we started to estimate the contact configuration and update the goalposts and compliantly trend, uh, move the pack structure into uh, the updated goalpost to accomplish the assembly. And in this example, we only considered two orientation uncertainties um, as shown here. And this is just another example with slightly different uncertainties just to show this process of uh, estimated contact configuration update the goal configuration and uh, accomplish the assembly. And here we have three pin packing code operations that are slightly more complex uh, parts. Again, nominal motion won't be the success of the assembly, but we have uh, an estimation of contact configurations based on our method, then compliant motion to move the structure into the updated predicted goalposts. Just another example here. We also consider the, some sharp pegging hole cases. Like in this case, we have two triangular pegs um, and try to do a dual uh, peg assembly, move around the nominal trajectory and detect the contact, applied method, estimate contact configuration, uncertainty, generate the so-called recovery motion to the updated goalpost and succeed. And, and in this case, we considered all six dimensional uncertainties as shown here. Um, the first line is the ground truth and the second line shows the predicted truth that my cursor shows. And we also improved the efficiency of the operation, so this is, actually much faster than the previous example I showed, even though there are more uh, uncertainties. 
higher dimensional uncertainty is considered. And this is the full packing hole structure with mixed shape packs and holes. Again, first move along the pack structure uh, through the nominal trajectory, contact detectors, apply our method, estimate the contact configuration, uh, predict uncertainty, generate the recovery motion to the uh, updated uh, pack. And notice that, uh, okay, let me just go back a little bit. So notice that uh, this is a successful case. Yeah, maybe I think I, I, I'm going too fast. Okay, here, this is the good case. <clears throat> this is the first um, uh, predicted uncertainty didn't lead to a success. So we do a second estimate to change the prediction and then do the insertion and lead to the succeed. So this is the full packing call operation again. So with the two rounds of uncertainty predictions and insertion and task is accomplished. So we have successfully done this type of uh, um, assembly in 10 to 20 seconds, even when uncertainties are greater than 10 times of the past tolerances. In this case, uh, 0 0.86 degrees in orientation tolerance and less than 1.5 millimeters in position tolerance. So it's quite successful. They, this is a rather deterministic method. It uh, achieves successful performance for repeated runs of the same task case and general to assembly parts of arbitrary geometry. Now, I'd like to talk a little bit about autonomous object modeling and recognition. We know we'd like to have appearance-based 3D object modeling of some unknown objects for the sake of uh, recognition and, and manipulation later. Common approaches include uh, having a fixed camera and put the object on a turntable or manually uh, change the object poses in front of the camera in order to capture the uh, surface appearance. Another approach is to fix objects but have the camera move around, uh, can be autonomously viewed uh, via view planning or manually. But the first type of approach is tedious and the second type of approach can be uh, model, uh, model uh, can, may not accomplish complete model. So we try to intervene perception and manipulation automatically to achieve this uh, kind of uh, object modeling. The approach is uh, very simple. Take an image and build a partial model and uh, then push the object to expose more surface to the camera, expand the model by registering uh, more images and so on. So this uh, process of image taking building, model building and object pushing until some 360 degrees of loop uh, has been accomplished. The next is to change the support surface because the surface on the table is not modeled yet. And we have a, a way of deciding what is the new support surface, try to make sure the object is stable. And also, it's easier to do the manipulation of changing the support surface. Then repeat the whole process until all surfaces are captured. Uh, we use a pairwise image registration here, like two adjacent images with overlapping uh, images of uh, the same scene, and use a uh, ACID uh, key point matching and iterative closest point algorithms to find the relative configuration of the point cloud of one image, uh, this RGBD sensing that way, um, with respect to the other. And after a rotation loop is closed, we further do a global optimization and use this virtual mate approach to try to eliminate um, propagated errors of uh, registration through this uh, reverse. Uh, 
refining of the configurations. So here we have an example, just first, first view and the partial model and push the object result a new view and slightly growing the partial model and push again and again. So I can move this a little bit faster. So this is a view 16 and this is the partial model. As you can see, it's a, it has some errors because uh, of a propagation. Okay, now this is the view 19. This has accomplished a loop and this is the current model after global optimization. Now change of support surface, the manipulator tries to, to find a new support surface, but it's not the, the smaller surface at the bottom, rather it's the surface opposite to the previous support surface just to be more stable. And this is the final model. So this shows the effect of uh, before and after global optimization. This, um, before the optimization, there's some gaps due to the accumulation of errors. And after the global optimization, those gaps are gone. Here, more object models. This is a red, quite a general method applicable for any objects that can be manipulated by a conventional manipulator um, to uh, obtain a complete uh, appearance-based model. What if the environment is cluttered? So what if we, we have a target object, we also have some obstacles in the scene that should be avoided. Um, in this case, we consider a continuum robot, uh, elephant trunk-like robot uh, with a tip camera because the continuum robot is flexi flexible with a smaller uh, footprint of uh, manipulation. So this is the target object. What we do is to interleave perception again and manipulation. So we have this uh, tip camera take a picture and then use that uh, partial model to guide the robot's motion. And as the robot discover more obstacles and more surface of the target object, it, it has a, a real-time motion planning to, to move further and further until some group is closed. So this is the, this uh, upper left corner shows what the image is from the uh, tip camera of the robot. And the robot doesn't have to recognize the obstacles, but it does uh, detect the, the presence of obstacles and do real-time motion planning to avoid collision with those obstacles. The motion planning is very fast. It's about the total time for, for that whole loop is about 20 milliseconds. So this is just another example. We have a, a coffee container. Uh, it's a much larger, so the robot is not large enough with all the expansion uh, to, to make an envelope of this a whole object. So in this case, uh, we combine the motion of one way and the motion in the counterclock way to capture the entire surrounding surface of the, the object. Yeah, we can move a little bit faster. And this is the final model of the uh, milk container. It doesn't have the top and bottom because our continuum robot only works in this example for what we, we did here, just a, a planner uh, surrounding motion. And this is a coffee container. So to summarize this part of the work, we have a 
general um, algorithm for automatic object modeling based on RGBB sensing, image registration, and manipulation. We talked about the conventional manipulation and also continuum arm, whole, whole arm manipulation in a cluttered scene. The method is robust to robust pose and motion uncertainty because our registration is based on image features, you know, not based on the where a robot is. As long as we have overlapping images, uh, then the model can be uh, quite accurate. And it works for many daily objects. Now, let's consider what if RGBD sensing is not effective? So what if uh, the, we, we need to recognize some objects in a dark room and or the, the object is transparent like this uh, water bottle um, so that uh, the depth sensing is, is not very effective. Um, our idea in this case is to consider having a continuum robot equipped with touch sensing to wrap around the annual object, sort of finding its way by touch the object, and then use the robot shape to encode the object shape. We use the robot shape to uh, as an identifier of the object shape. Of course, we use the robot to wrap around the object in many ways, and we use this combination of shapes to recognize object. So notice that we, we have some very sparse uh, touch sensors, but we don't use sensors directly to detect an object shape. Rather, we use the sensors just to guide the robot motion. So we do a touch-based, a touch-driven whole arm wrapping of the object, and then use the robot shape described with cord histogram and next, we use that description to train a, a object classifiers, category classifiers. And uh, finally, with the classifier, we can do object recognition, again, through wrapping around unknown objects. So this is just uh, shows the touch-driven whole arm wrapping of different kinds of objects. And of course, the shape of the robot is not the same as the shape of the object in many ways. But the whole idea is that there's something about the object captured by the shape of the robot as it wraps around an object. And we use that to as identifiers of the original object. It's a oh, different wrapping for different objects. And um, here show, shows a number of objects with different kinds of uh, wrapping shapes of the robot to encode object cross-section. Because the object is a 3D object and our robot moves in a plane, so in order to capture the 3D shape, we consider decomposing the workspace of the robot as different planes. And for each plane, we do a planar wrap of uh, the object. And we collect all the robot shapes of all these wraps together and, and represent an arm shape as a set of chords. So for each 3D chord, we use uh, seven parameters, length, chord angles, and also endpoint surface normals to represent it. So for a single shape of a, a robot, we can have multiple chords. And we use the set of chords of different wraps of an object to, to represent that object by uh, putting them into a seven dimensional histogram. And each dimension represents a parameter. And we just apply PCA to reduce the redundancy because there are many, many cores, not all cores are equally useful. And we train a support vector machine to classify objects based on core histograms. Now, once the object classifiers are determined, we, the next problem is given an unknown object, how to conduct wrappings for recognition. 
our approach is the mark of the decision process. We use Monte Carlo tree search to uh, decide the sequence of wrappings. Uh, taking into account the trade-off between cost of incorrect recognition and cost of robot movement. So for this tree search, it's not each node, is a core histogram of all wraps observed so far. The next move is to decide what is the best wrap following that and, uh, and after that. So we use a cost function balancing the movement cost of the robot from one rack to another, and the cost of misprediction. And we make them a, a weighted sum to guide the tree search. And with this method, we have found that often we just use 10 wraps to kind of characterize an object pretty well. With 1,500 to 3,000 cores per object, 100 milliseconds to one second per wrap, and we've done this for 185 objects in 10 categories. The classification accuracy is about 76% using media support vector machines. So for active guidance to recognize an object, uh, we consider multiple iterations. And each iteration results in a sequence of wraps. And new iterations are uh, adding more information. So here we, we have the prediction, prob probability of prediction, number of wraps for different iterations for a number of uh, uh, sample objects. So uh, as can be imagined, more wraps and more iterations can build better, stronger prediction. So you see the increase of probabilities as more wraps uh, conduct, uh, conducted. But sometimes we can get lucky. And in the case of the hammer, just one iteration with two wraps, we can predict the object category successfully with 70% probability. Some real experiments. This is a, a continuum robot built by my colleague, uh, Chidash O'Nell's group. With uh, three sections, I will put the touch sensors here and to wrap around the object. This is uh, uh, how the, the touch sensor is used to guide the wrapping around motion for different objects. As you can see, we don't have many touch uh, sensors in, in, in this experiment, only three actually. And there's a teapot. So we, uh, what we did is we used simulation to train classifiers. And the classifiers trained by the simulation is, um, are then applied to real world object recognition. So there's this a seem to real transferable object classification. Um, here I show just some uh, sample objects, and these are real, corresponding real objects. Um, the uh, scene trained solely from simulated wraps work pretty well for this bottle and for teapot, but for uh, this box, it's, it's just uh, totally failed. And it's thought it was a bottle. That's because actually a malfunction sensor, touch sensor, makes the robot uh, didn't realize it's already touched the object and continue deform, continue try to, to wrap around the object. So it results in a shape very similar to the shape when it wraps around a bottle. That causes the, the wrong classification. And just some uh, video to show the real operation. Have the robot, and this shows different kinds of wraps from planar wraps to uh, wraps along a different plane. So we call spatial wrap in this case. And for different objects.
So some results. You can see that for planar rats only, the recognition probability is uh, our recognition probabilities are pretty high. But when we have a combination of planar spatial rats, the probabilities are actually lower. This is because the spatial wraps are not as accurate as planar wraps comparing to the simulation. You remember, we trained the classifiers in simulation and we directly apply that to real world um, object recognition. The spatial wraps suffer from the gravity effect. So it's less accurate, it has more deformation of the shape of the robot and that affects the results. So certainly we need to do more to improve the situation. I just introduced a touch-based wrapping of objects for recognition through the robot shapes after wrapping and use minimum touch sensing just for guiding the action, but not for recognition. So the method is applicable to objects where vision sensing or RGBD sensing is not effective, but more work can be done, a lot more work can be done to improve the robot sensing and the learning. We just use a very simple learning um, SVM uh, classifiers, but we can certainly do more there. Next, I just want to talk a little bit about the real-time adaptive motion planning and certain environments uh, that we have uh, worked on. We consider a robot operating in a dynamically unknown environment with uh, dynamic unknown obstacles. Um, so the, for, for that kind of environment, planning has to be real-time and very adaptive to the changes of the environment. This is the work that's actually started from my students a long time ago in 2008 uh, for mobile manipulators, high dimensional robots working in dynamically unknown environments. And later by my student work uh, to apply this to non holonomic robots and uh, more recently to task constrained robot operations. So here the robot is equipped with sensors and sensing, planning and control cycles are is really concurrent or simultaneously occurring as the robot moves. The main idea of planning is to maintain a diverse population of trajectories and constantly, constantly adapt, evolve, and re-rank or re uh, the, the goodness of uh, trajectories. So a simple idea here, you can consider this as the configuration space of the robot. And this is the beginning configuration and this is the goal configuration. So we maintain this family of trajectories. And, and at this moment, this thick one seems to be the best. So the robot will start moving along this one. As it moves, objects can have unpredictable motion too. Like these objects may block this um, originally thought best path or trajectory. So the robot constantly first adapt its uh, uh, set of trajectories by uh, making the trajectory always starting from the current location and also re-rank trajectories. So at this point, the robot will think that this trajectory, this uh, red one, which is actually adapted and evolved from this green one here, is the best trajectory. So it simply switches. So it doesn't try to create a better trajectory, but it's constantly re rank and uh, then switch the better trajectory to be very fast, to be, uh, to be able to operate in real time and uh, avoiding unknown dynamic obstacles. So repeatedly, the robots simultaneously sense, move, evolve the trajectories and switch to uh, always the current best trajectory as it moves. This is just a, a simple example. It's not very complicated, but still the robot doesn't know the person or this uh, blue robot acts as an unknown dynamic obstacle. You just use a simple uh, depth sensor to, to check the objects to model the objects as it goes and uh, evolve its trajectories to avoid obstacles and try to still reach its goal. 
We also apply this approach to task constraint um, motion planning. So for example, if a robot takes a cup of water and try to move the, this cup of water to somewhere without spilling the water, that is uh, a task constraint motion. Uh, in this case, we cons consider again, this a family of uh, robot trajectories, but we also consider subpopulations with a, a subpopulation of task constraint trajectory. And um, of course, in this case, high dimensional with a manipulator or a so-called task constraint temporary trajectory. When something happens, it has to switch to, to a different uh, intermediate goal state in order to avoid um, violation of task constraints um, and at the same time avoid obstacles or sometimes it has to release the task constraints and then recover when the obstacles move away. So we have these uh, non-task constraint uh, population of trajectories too. All of these are in the same population and governed by the same ramp algorithm to uh, decide on the fly what to do. Okay, so here's an example. We have this uh, manipulator holding a cup of water and tries to move it without spilling water. And then some uh, random unknown obstacle come, it, it has to try to avoid it, still accomplish the task. But sometimes the obstacle is persistent, so the robot try to release the task by putting down the uh, cup to some intermediate goal uh, position. And once the object obstacle leaves, it started to resume its task of uh, transferring the cup of water to the goal configuration. Just another constraint task, try to push a drawer into uh, its place, but then has to avoid some uh, unknown obstacle. We, we just use the UAV. So release the task and then accomplish it. The important thing is all of these different behaviors were governed by the same algorithm. We don't pre-code when to do what. It's just that once you see something it can switch to different populations of trajectories and to, to use the best one based on some uh, optimization criteria. So finally, I'd like to also talk a little bit about semantic slam in unknown environments. Semantic slam is to capture and map the semantic information of the environment in terms of the objects during some simultaneous localization and mapping. Most of the localized, simultaneous localization mapping or SLAM algorithms use low level geometrical features and have no idea about the semantics of the environment. But they are more recently, there are more and more approaches for semantic SLAMs. But uh, these approaches do not tend to consider the semantic level data association. Data association usually is still uh, done at the low level geometric features or the representation of semantic objects uh, based on just point representation that uh, may not work very well for capturing the uh, data association. Uh, and often these al algorithms cannot do real time association. So we try to uh, consider real time object level data association in semantic slam. So idea is that once we have an image, we first use a, a Euro V3, the 2D a image uh, identifier to uh, identify and put the 2D bounding box of the object label. And next we use a dual quadric to model the actual 3D shape of the object and the size of the object with the 3D object position and orientation captured to build this a semantic level uh, mapped objects as shown here. Now when a new image comes, 
we will try to do data association by first consider all the map objects, the semantic information to see if the semantic information is consistent with a newly found object. And if uh, the consistency is there, we further consider geometric information and try to find the candidates. In this case, we can see this is a cup and used to be found in the registered map objects. And here shows some uh, real uh, real-time operations. We use the TOM, RGBD, FR1 uh, sequence. Uh, this is the, the video sequence that we, we apply v 3 to find the objects in 2D form, the only box, and then we, we fit object with the quadric to capture it to 3D shape and 3D size and do data association in real time. So you can see from frame to frame, if it's the same object, the label doesn't change uh, because we, our system recognizes it was found before. And this is the, the speed is what you see is what you get in real time. Finally, I also would like to say how we use 3D semantic level objects for better loop closure detection. We use the 3D semantic provisibility graphs, uh, which is uh, constructed in uh, such a way that each node is a, a semantic object and the edge is added between two semantic objects if the all two objects are observed together for three times or more. So for each scene, in each frame, we can construct this object covisibility graph and compare the covisibility graphs of uh, two frames to detect if a uh, loop closure happens or not. In this example, we have two apartment scenes, but these are different apartments in different levels uh, of, uh, of a building. Uh, by using low level uh, SLAM algorithms like ORP SLAM 2 or um, ORP SLAM 3, loop closure is considered happen, but that's a, a false detection because these are, are not really the same scene, although the low level features are very similar. But with semantic level co visibility graphs, we can easily detect that these are two different scenes. There, so there's no loop closure here. And this is the most recent work um, that appears uh, in this year's ICRA and RAL. So to summarize, um, I have introduced a little bit of our research for perception and action synergy in, two, uh, in four areas, robotic assembly in the present uncertainty, autonomous object modeling and recognition, real-time adaptive motion planning in uncertain environments, and semantic slam in unknown environments. Uh, for each of these areas, a lot more research can be done, but it's also in interesting to see the connection to integration of these different components to uh, enable robots greater capabilities to solve a wide range of real-world problems. I'd like to acknowledge all the students involved in the work presented here, the upper row here, and all my collaborators and their contributions to, to the work here. Thank you. All right, thank you. Wait, wait. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so do you have any questions? And let's just blurt them out. You don't have to be called on. Just you know, in the chat, people are telling Jing Zhao that you have just gave a great talk. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I, I'd like to hear some questions. Um, yeah. uh, hi, so thank you for the talk. Um, Sorry, how are you? Oh, please, please, please go, go, go. Sorry. Okay. Um, so I had a question about your uh, 
the manipulation and sensing with the continuum arm. Um, in the uh, examples you, you gave, you use kind of rigid objects that you're trying to sense. Um, do you think there's a way to extend your technique to sort of use the compliance of the object that you're, that you're sensing? For instance, like if you had a empty water bottle versus a full water bottle to get more information about it? Yeah, that's an interesting thought. We, uh, we haven't really considered the compliance of the object. Uh, as you say, a empty water bottle can be, you can squeeze it. And we try, actually, we try not to squeeze the object. That's why we use the touch sensor to make sure the, the robot touches the object without squeezing it, because we don't want to, uh, to change the shape of the robot and um, to make the recognition uh, less reliable. Uh, but this is a good thought. If uh, we actually use the change of the shape robot to, to detect the different um, material properties or softness or a half empty bottle versus the full bottle, that certainly is a good direction that we can consider. Thank you for, for this suggestion. Thank you. And uh, we have Eric here. A little louder, Eric. Uh, can can you hear me all right? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, I, I was wondering, as you're kind of uh, reconstructing an unknown scene, let's say you're, I don't know, you've got a, a good picture of like two thirds of the scene. Any thoughts on how you pick like which parts of the scene most need more information, or like like where you should go to get new images, or to, to best fill in the rest of the scene? You're talking about the object modeling. Appearance. Yeah, I, I was kind of imagining you, you like the movable camera as it kind of snaked yeah. around the scene. Like, like, is there a fixed path there, or do you decide do you decide which parts of it need more information filled in? Yeah, it, in this example, we didn't really consider uh, how to pick an object to 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 do the modeling. As you said, which object needs more information? Uh, we just uh, try to see if we can use just a little bit of sensing information to, to move the, the robot around, uh, avoiding other obstacles. Um, but uh, certainly that's a, a challenging uh, question. Once you have a scene and you don't even have a full picture because you rely on the sensor on the robot to, to, to guide the robot uh, to see the environment how to detect, how to decide which object is more useful for, for this uh, modeling. I, I don't have a, an answer for that right now. Um, but I, I assume that you, one can have the robot just start modeling things as it sees, sees an object and just try to wrap around, and then sees another object, try to wrap around and try to to uh, gain more object models in the scene that way and to decide depending on the task uh, with, whether it should stop or uh, just uh, think that it has accomplished its goal to find it has already found the water cup, for example, and uh, just fetch the cup without care about the rest of the stuff in the scene. Thanks. Okay, does anyone else have any more questions? I see Rabbi. Uh, hi, Dr. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, that's a nice presentation. Uh, uh, your, your presentation, especially autonomous robot modeling, makes me very much interested. I wanted to know about the application of Markov decision process that you discussed in your page 36, where you have used that how the Markovian decision process is applied for the robot modeling cases. Uh, my question is that uh, except Markov decision process, have you considered other approaches, Markovian chains and so on to model your robot modeling and how it works there? Um, yeah, we haven't really considered uh, the other methods. I, I wish I had more students to continue in this direction. Um, so it's uh, it's uh, basically just 
consider this as a one way to decide um, how to wrap around the, an object effectively for recognition. But I, I think even random wrapping around, if you have, have an unknown object, you start to wrap around randomly, uh, you can gather in, enough information to, to do some uh, recognition. It's just that using this amount of uh, um, multicolor tree search, we deliberately balance the recognition rate or accuracy and the efficiency of the movements, try to make things more efficient. But no, I haven't considered using other approaches for, for the uh, decision of a sequence of actions of wrapping. Uh, thank you for your response. Uh, I have a, a backup question regarding this issue that have you considered finite state stochastic Markovian process or it is uh, uh, deterministic? Uh, it's a, a it's not a, a, a finite state. Is that what you, your question is, finite state or just the? Uh, Non-finite state. I mean, the state can be infinite and you can go through some uh, stochastic approaches to have the full idea of the modeling. Yeah, it's, a, it's just a stochastic process to, to find a, a, some sequence and sequence is not even complete. That's why we, we can't have just a finite tree. We do a sequence. And if this sequence doesn't work very well for recognition, we do another iteration, but it's stochastic. So it's nice, it, it, it will um, likely to lead to a different sequence. Thank you for your response. All right, well, let's uh, take this time to thank our speaker again. And um, I hope everyone has a good weekend. Jing Zhao, thank you for your talk. Well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me.